Good afternoon, Roy Oppenheim here from Oppenheim Law. This is our 14th Zoom at noon. And if you can believe it, it all started in this room, right when we were closing down the office and the stay at home orders were, were beginning. And, and uh, now uh, this is the first time we're doing a Zoom at noon back in the office after 14 weeks. Um, I want to thank, of course, those people who are assisting us today. Uh, Jeff Sherman, my partner, Ellen Polowski, my, my partner and uh, Paula Bagara, who helped uh, put this presentation together also. Today, we're very fortunate to have a guest. We're gonna be talking about how COVID-19 is actually making the courts better. And we have a very distinguished judge who, who will be joining us. I'll introduce him shortly. Uh, but before that, if you go to the next page, uh, I wanna talk about uh, what we're gonna be talking about. Thank you. Uh, first, we're gonna be going over the weekly unemployment and economic uh, updates and we're going to go in, uh, then we're going to do a pandemic update and then we're going to have a conversation with the Honorable Dennis Bailey uh, and uh, it's going to be a view of the pandemic from the bench. Uh, in terms of our firm, those of you who know us, uh, we were founded in 1989 and we've had over 75 years of legal experience. We have five lawyers and we've been providing uh, expertise in the area of real estate and commercial litigation over, over the years. During these past 14 weeks, so uh, the past several months, we have been uh, advising and consulting our clients on various issues concerning the pandemic, which include, of course, employer-employee relations, uh, the PPP, uh, government stimulus issues, as well as landlord-tenant and mortgage and mortgagee issues. And these issues will continue for some time to come, especially as the legal system attempts to try and become a bit more robust as, as it tries to address these issues. Um, as I mentioned, here is our team, and uh, we also have Paolo Vergara, as I mentioned, and of course, Mia Singh, Mia Singh our, our senior associate. Um, I would like to introduce Dennis Bailey, Honorable Dennis Bailey, if I may. Uh, he is uh, picture of him. Uh, elected, he was elected to the court in, uh, in 2014. The Honorable Dennis Bailey is, is from the 17th Circuit Court Judge serving Broward County, Florida. Judge Bailey has made national headlines concerning his commentary on uh, attorney Zoom decorum and we'll discuss the effects of the pandemic on the court. Um, last week, we talked a little bit about how uh, the nation uh, is, is addressing the, the recession as well as the pandemic and how the social movements that are evolving are impacting the real estate market. This week, we will have a unique opportunity to take a sneak peek at the experiences our judiciary is dealing with in these unprecedented times. To begin with, let's look at uh, the unemployment numbers. They're kind of interesting. The charts are very interesting. Um, and you can see that, that what's going on is that, um, first of all, there's, of course, a, a, an issue concerning accounting misclassification and an official classification of unemployment. But we're actually seeing the number of folks who are applying for unemployment uh, dropping. And so that is kind of a somewhat good news as, as we proceed. And hopefully, uh, that number will continue to decline. Uh, if it's going to be a, a V-shaped recovery, the V would have to come down as quickly as the line went up, and uh, it's more likely that we're looking more of an L or a U-shaped kind of recovery, but time will tell as we see that. Initial jobless claims are also dropping very precipitously, and that is also somewhat good news, and of course the stock market is responding to that. This is the volatility index, which shows how volatile uh, things have become uh, during this first and second quarter of 2020. What's more interesting, of course, is that uh, many folks who have not been previously in the stock market, particularly gamblers, people who've been watching sports who now are bored, have decided that their new pension is going to be the stock market. And so a lot of the volatility is, is coming through through uh, uh, sports people who historically, you know, have lost their football, lost their basketball, lost their hockey and maybe baseball. And so uh, the stock market has become their, their new pension. Um, in terms of the virus itself, it's, it's, it's a tricky situation as, as the country tries to open up and different states open up, we're seeing an increase in the number of actual folks who are, who are getting the virus. Uh, to some extent, that's maybe because of more testing. So I would advise that instead of looking at the number of people that are being tested and the number of people who are contracting the disease, we really should be looking at hospitalizations and of course, uh, intensive care beds and to make sure that those beds do not fill up. To the extent they start filling up, you have a health crisis that becomes a real serious problem. And of course, as the deaths go up, that also becomes an issue. Of course, how the deaths get classified is also a, an interesting issue. But the real issue for all of us is, is the hospitalizations. And that's, I think, what we all should, should be focusing on. In terms of Florida, uh, 
as the state has opened up, we're seeing that there has in fact been uh, an increase and in, an uptick on, on all three in the number of deaths, the number of cases, and of course the number of hospitalizations. And that will of course be an issue for what institutions do like schools and of course the courts as we, as we proceed forward. In terms of the subways in New York, a good example, experts are saying that you know unless the windows can be open or maybe the roof's literally sheared to create proper ventilation, same thing with offices, uh, that indoor spaces are, are not gonna be preferred locations until there is indeed a vaccine. UV lighting is, is one issue that people are looking at, but who knows if that's gonna be effective or not. And of course, there's tons of advice out there from everyone on what works, what doesn't work. That's, that happened 100 years ago, and that's happening again today. This is from a newspaper in 1918 and 1919 during the, the Spanish flu. So let's go on to the main event here with uh, the Honorable Bennett Bailey. Uh, this is actually interesting. We can get the judge on. Judge, you there? I'm here, but... One second. There we go. There we go. Uh, good to see you, Your Honor. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, I, we have here a picture, I don't know if you can see it, of, of, a, of a trial occurring in San Francisco. In, uh, uh, 19, it, it says 1819, but it was 1918, 1919, actually, 100, 100 years ago. Um, and uh, I, want you, I wanted to ask you what you thought of, of, of maybe having outdoor trials. <laughs> well, first of all, I want to point out that I'm old, but I'm not that old. I'm not in the picture, actually. Um, <laughs> The, uh, I'm always amazed, and this is San Francisco, it's obviously different, but I'm always amazed when I see pictures of uh, Broward County from 100 years ago and how everybody is in suits and coats and ties, and it had to be sweltering heat back in those days. So I think that's the, uh, our, our comfort level is used to central air conditioning. I don't know that the participants would tolerate an open air trial. By the way, if anyone has any questions, please send them through. The judge and I will be glad to answer them as, as we're going through this. Your Honor, so, so tell us what, what the big changes that have occurred in the last uh, three to six months in terms of uh, uh, being a, a jurist uh, in, uh, in Broward and in the United States. It's been interesting to see how it affects the different types of court systems that we have. Um, obviously, the hardest hit aspect of the court system has been the jury system. The uh, Everyone is still looking for a way to get the jury system back on track. If it's not going to be by live jurors in the courtroom, um, can we do it by uh, online, such as Zoom? Even if we are in the courtroom, um, do we have jurors sit next to each other? Are they confined to the jury box? Are they confined to a small jury room to do their deliberations? So that we need to physically reinvent the plant that is the courtroom and that is the uh, courthouse before we can bring jurors back into the system. If we need to keep the courthouse closed longer than we anticipated, can we move to an online jury system? And what would that look like? Broward has been uh, leading in its investigation of that aspect of it. We have a video online available now that shows a, a, a mock jury selection process where all the jurors are at home and using uh, online access to the courthouse to participate. So let me ask you, I mean, it's one thing for you as a professional to be using Zoom and to understand how to do maybe a, 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 a trial that, that's just a bench trial or maybe a motion hearing, but how do we expect the average person to be able to use Zoom, to expect that they have the proper technology, that they have the wherewithal to, to actually uh, sit there and, and not have the cat, the dog, uh, and everyone else disturb them, you know, for a period of time? Is that, is that asking too much of our, of our jurists, in, in your opinion? It, no, it's asking, it, it is an ask, but it's not asking too much. The, um, um, I'm in the family division now, and what most people don't realize about the family division is that it's more than 50% uh, unrepresented people on both sides of the table. Um, about 25% of my cases have lawyers on both sides of the table. Another 25% have a lawyer representing one client, the other client is without a lawyer, and a good half, more than half actually, uh, there's no lawyer in the room. It's just citizen against citizen. And uh, I've been very pleasantly surprised with how well they have risen to the uh, challenge of going online and having their hearing online. And some of them have the teenager that can help them figure out how to set it up and where to click to get on the screen and so on. Some use their cell phones and, and do it from their cars. Um, but there is occasionally the, uh, the lawyer comes in and says, Judge, my client is elderly. There's no way she's gonna be able to figure out how to do this. Uh, can we please wait until the courthouse reopens? 
Um, and then clients call and say, I don't have an access to a computer. I don't have an access uh, to a, a, a camera on my cell phone. I can't do this via Zoom. The problem with cell phones is that it adds another layer to the responsibility of the, of the party in that if I can't see you and I can't swear you in, then you have to have a notary there with you and swear you in. The biggest challenge is getting them sworn in so that uh, if they don't have access to a, a camera, they need to have but they need to go to a notary and have them swear in them. And, and what do you think in terms of due process? Do you think there, there are issues in terms of uh, when you when you cross-examine a witness via Zoom that you, you really don't have the same ability to get that, that gotcha moment because uh, there could be someone off camera coaching them. Uh, they could have notes in front of them that you don't see. Uh, there could be other external events that are, that are transpiring in the room that, that, that we just don't have a clue about. What's your thought on, on that in terms of due process? It's an artificial system. It doesn't have the natural flow of, of the courtroom. The, um, the biggest challenge has been the uh, handling objections during the course of testimony. If somebody is, is um, going into an area of hearsay, the lawyer is trying to stop the witness. Zoom is, a, is an imperfect system. It's been a great asset to getting us uh, keeping momentum, for instance, in the family courts. But it has its limitations. And, and when somebody's speaking, the microphone goes to whoever is speaking, um, often whoever is speaking the loudest. So if the witness is going into improper testimony, the lawyer is trying to object. They cannot object because it can't be heard. But the witness can't hear them, so they don't know to stop. They just keep going. And it's a very frustrating experience. So that sometimes we come up with a new rule on how to handle these things. That I'm watching the screen. If the lawyer has an objection, they raise their hand in front of the screen and uh and i know he's got an objection i'm not going to try to stop the witness or i'll raise my hand to the witness to stop them and then get to the objection but if i see their hand go up i know it's a contemporaneous objection and their record is preserved would you in theory mute the witness if they're going into an area that's inappropriate since you control the the the, the, the entire I've not, i've muted i've muted witnesses when they refuse to stop um when uh, uh and again, because I'm dealing with pro se, um, they have a right to cross-examine the other party. Well, sometimes it's their ex-spouse. And so when they ask the ex-spouse a fact question and the spouse answers, they launch into, no, that's not true, because I told you, and now they're, they're not asking questions, they're launching into their summation of the trial and, and try to get them to stop. They don't stop, I just put them on mute until they notice that they're on mute. So, so let me ask a question, do you think that this Zoom is actually bringing the courthouse in some ways closer to the community in that people don't feel as, I guess, intimidated by going into a, a vaulted ceiling uh, courthouse with you know beautiful windows and, and all the accoutrements of, 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 of institutionalism and, and that you know someone could literally you know just get on their phone, sit in their car and, and, and be at trial. And, and the question is, do you think that in some ways that, that brings the courthouse closer to the community and gives people more access to the legal system. I'm kind of curious about no, that. No, there's no question that it does. Um, and it comes with pluses and minuses. The plus is they don't have to take a full day off of work. They don't have to drive to the courthouse. They don't have to pay for parking. They don't have to go through security. They don't have to sit on a hard wooden bench in the hallway waiting for their case to be called um, and pay their lawyer hourly for all of this themselves so the lawyers spend all day there. So in a very real sense, the hearing is just limited to that time. If the hearing is set for two o'clock, they just need to turn on their camera at two o'clock. They don't need to spend the whole day preparing. And this um, leads, this leads to ahead. a question that, I'm sorry, Yar, that someone has a question just on this point. Does the judge think we'll ever go back to going into actual court? How will the court look face shields? The, the short answer is yes. There are a lot of things that, uh, that we need to do in the courtroom. The more complex a trial is, the more difficult it is on Zoom. If I can have 15 witnesses, I've handled complex litigation where there have been over 200 exhibits put into evidence. And exhibits are, are, are a source of problem online, how to handle the exhibit, how to perfect the record. Um, and we have a system now where the attorney will move a document into evidence. I'll call it exhibit one, we'll identify it. And it's a seven page document calling, uh, uh, you know, contract between A and B. And now that's in evidence as exhibit one. At the end of the trial, we get from the clerk their list of exhibits, their official list, 
We send it to the attorneys. The attorneys have to match up the exhibits that they talked about with the clerk's exhibits, send it back to me, and then put it into the court system. If there's a mistake along the way between all those steps, the record is not gonna be what the record should be. So there's a risk involved. We, can, we need to avoid that risk with the, with the more complex cases especially. We need to avoid it in all cases, but the complex ones are the problem. So there'll always be a need to be in the courthouse. I think the better question is in uh, the five minute hearings where there are no witnesses and evidence, do we really need to go all the way to the east side of Fort Lauderdale to go to the courthouse to have that hearing? Does a lawyer from Weston or a lawyer from Coral Springs or a lawyer from Miramar have to drive all the way to East Fort Lauderdale for a, a, a case management conference that doesn't require witnesses or evidence? So, so without getting into the too far into the weeds, if, if let's say it's a foreclosure and you have to show the original note, or let's say it's a will contest and you have to determine whether it's a, a jury trial or, or even a bench trial, you have to determine if the will is authentic based on the signatures, based on the, on the quality of the paper. How do you do that using Zoom? You can't. There are cases where I tell the attorneys, you're gonna to need to get that physical exhibit to me beforehand. Um, there are color photographs that they need to put in. There's a color video that they need to put in. Um, I need to see that at the time I'm making a decision in the trial. Um, get it to me before the hearing. So, so how does um, there it are, go ahead. I was going to say, how would opposing counsel then have an opportunity to review that document also and, and, and contest it, whether it's an original note in a foreclosure or, or again, an original will in, in, a, uh, in a will contest? It, it increases the responsibility of everybody, including the judge, at the case management conference or the calendar call, whatever terminology the judge uses, to say, okay, we're going to go to trial on this in two weeks. In the next two weeks, go meet with the other side, take a look at all the exhibits, see them firsthand. So when we talk about a trial, I can't have you, the attorney saying, judge, I haven't seen that exhibit yet. Well, you should have. You should have gone the last two weeks. We talked about that. Um, so that the, it increases uh, everybody's, it's almost like uh, switching to, to uh, television. It's, it's almost like a script. You've got to go into production. You've got to go see the exhibits beforehand. You've got to prepare what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, make sure everybody's got exhibits. We have done, for years, we have done um, expert witnesses appearing uh, via Skype or via uh, closed circuit TV from California or whatever. And when you do that, it increases the amount of logistics that need to happen before the trial. And I think that's the key to successful trials on Zoom is everybody handling the heightened logistical challenges. So I guess the question is, when do you think we will go back possibly to the courthouse where jurors will, will sit, you know, next to each other and, and you'll have people in the audience, uh, you know, actually sitting there. I mean, I guess the question is, you know, when, when could that happen? That's, that's a great question. I don't know if Washington DC knows the answer to that question yet. Um, it's going to be statewide. You see the governor on television every other day talking about what's going to reopen when. Florida Supreme Court has to make decisions on when the courts are going to reopen, when the persons in the criminal system there are certain constitutional rights to um, speedy trial and, and to uh, due process. Those have been stayed during the coronavirus. You can't have a speedy trial if the courthouses are closed. Um, they have to be reopened. The clocks have to start again. We have to bring jurors back into the system. Um, we expect that there are going to be a very low turnout of jurors willing to come to the courthouse, willing to sit uh, in the jury room and ride the elevators. Um, but also, there are uh, many jurors who are going to say, look, if society's reopened, I can't afford to go to the courthouse. i got to go back to work. So that uh, we're going to have a real challenge on our hands on getting jurors available to hear jury trials once we do start up again. So someone asked if you miss the human interaction, you know, the, the, the actual Absolutely. person to person. Absolutely. And uh, it, it, uh, it is a very impersonal process. I go into work. I do go to the courthouse every day to work. Um, I ride my, uh, I go through the judge's entrance, I ride the judge's elevator up to the judge's floor, I go to my chambers, the only person I see is my judicial assistant, and I sit in my chambers all day from 8.30 to 5 on Zoom, seeing all these people all day, every day, uh, and then I leave the same way I came in. It's a very uh, lonely process. Um, I, a good friend of mine recently became a federal judge, and I teased him then that uh, it's a, the Life of a federal judge is more lonely than life of a state judge. It's just the nature of the beast. 
and now I'm living the life of a federal judge with all the perks. Oh, that's funny. Let me ask you, uh, I know you, you made some national uh, notoriety when you commented a few months ago on, on the decorum of lawyers uh, on Zoom. Have you seen an improvement since uh, this became a, a, a national issue or, is it, or are there still problems? Uh, I see. Uh, I've seen great improvement. Uh, it, it happened immediately in response to what happened. Uh, first of all, I didn't expect any of that to go viral like it did. Uh, but I've seen seminars, uh, you know, national seminars that start with uh, "Please put on a shirt." I've seen uh, local articles in, like, in the Broward County uh, uh, Bar Association barrister about uh, the dress code for Zoom and so on. So that it's been a topic of discussion. Um, you never like to be the first one in through the door. I happen to be the first one in through the door on that issue, but it's, it's been uh, improved dramatically. And it's, it's, it's it, at times there are light moments. The, uh, there was an attorney the other day who had to go across his office and get something. And I noticed that he was in a coat and tie, but he was wearing Bermuda shorts. Um, so that, uh, it, uh, and by the way, I'm not wearing Bermuda shorts today, but uh, <laughs> it's, it, it's improved dramatically. We still have we still have the odd situation. I had a hearing this week for the pro se person, and he was literally riding the city bus trying to talk to me uh, in in the hearing. And I said, "You got to take the next bus stop and get off. I can't do this hearing with you riding a city bus." But that's, that's one of the things that Zoom does. You can be anywhere. I've done a number of hearings. It's rare for me to go a week without somebody doing hearing from their car. Sometimes police officers are testifying from their squad car. So, so what happens when when technology fails? For example, there was like a, a national outage yesterday of certain cell phone carriers for a period of time. What do you do if someone just drops, whether you drop or, or, or a plaintiff right. drops or, or, or even a, a, a member of the jury just drops because of technology? What, what do we do then? It, it's, it's no different than what we do uh, in life when uh, the fire alarm goes off in the courthouse or that there's a storm and everybody has to leave to go home early. Uh, you interrupt. You interrupt the process. And I, for... Um, as long as I've been a lawyer, as long as I've been a judge, we've always told jurors that uh, we estimate the end of this trial will be on Tuesday or on Thursday. We don't know for sure because life sometimes interrupts, but we estimate it'll be that day. And you deal with the interruptions as they come up. Um, the judge has to keep watching on Zoom to make sure the lawyers are there. Somebody all of a sudden disappears. And that happens not once a day, but it happens several times a week. Um, you got to stop the hearing. Let's take a break and then wait for him to get back on. So these Zoom calls are public hearings, are they not? Couldn't anyone actually participate if, if, if they have the, the dial-in? And how do they get that information if they're interested in a particular trial? The, I have had, uh, haven't had a week yet where somebody wasn't sitting in watching who's not a party, not a witness. Um, they get it from the parties. Usually it's a family member. It's a supportive sibling or, or a nephew or a cousin. Um, and they, uh, I ask them who they are because I don't know if it's a witness. And so I'll bring them into the Zoom hearing in front of the other attorneys. And I'll ask, you know, who are you? What's your, what's your interest in the case? They say, I'm a witness. They say, okay, I'll put them back in the, the quote, wedding room, end quote. Um, otherwise, if they say, uh, I'm just an interested citizen, I'll say, okay. And I turn off their camera and mute them. But they can see and hear the trial. We just can't see and hear them because I don't want them to interrupt. So let me ask it's a question. It's going to be interesting. Okay. Go ahead. I, I, you know, right now, if you want to televise or, or film a, a hearing, you have to get approval from the, the judge if it's, if it's in, in person or, or from the clerk of court. But now, since these are all being taped, are, aren't, isn't really every single proceeding that's going on now open to the entire public? And, you know, up, you know and I, I think that it just creates more, more opportunity for people to see how the system works. Well, keep in mind that every, the courtrooms are always open to the public, with a few exceptions, when there's a child witness testifying about sexual child abuse or something of that nature, but they're all open. Um, in fact, the, the interesting question is when we go back and we have social distancing um, and the people want to sit in and watch the trial because it's high profile and it's grabbed the attention of the public for one reason or, or another, are we going to keep them out because there's not enough seating in the back for social distancing? Are we going to curtail their right to sit in and watch the trial? In criminal, there's, there's a body of case law about you're not allowed to preclude family members from, from the defendant or from the victim from watching the trial. You have to make accommodations, even if they want to watch jury selection. You have to make accommodations. So that uh, what happens when we go back and we can't fit everybody? Um, do we turn the Zoom cameras around so now the camera is not facing 
the lawyers and the judge and cameras facing the courtroom as a bird's eye view to allow other people from home to click on and watch. Very interesting. Uh, one question uh, from the audience is how much are the courts backed up now and will it ever get uh, you know, un unclogged or is there not a backup? Certainly it will be unclogged. Certainly there is a backup. And depending on what division you're in uh, affects the nature of the backup. The family courts, for instance, there's no backup. We've not missed a week of work. Uh, we've been going in and Zooming from day one. Uh, my my uh, docket has not increased in the number of cases pending at all during this coronavirus because I've been able to go on every day and do non-jury hearings, even trials, um, despite the isolation. Um, not so with the criminal system. It's, it's, that's been most affected by it. But one of the things that we've seen happen is to minimize the, the detrimental impact of that delay um, is, a, is a different attitude towards incarceration while the case is pending. We have done a great job in Broward of lowering the jail population, releasing as many people as we can, so not sitting in an isolated space with closed windows that won't open, with uh, ventil you know, poorly ventilated air or well-ventilated air, doesn't seem to matter, uh, but they're in a risk situation. So that uh, in Broward County, where we for many years operated under a federal dictate to empty our jails because we were over 100% capacity, we are now below 66% capacity in Broward County in our jails as of this morning. And that's been through a great effort in Broward County. So that so, so have we're trying we, have to we minimize seen... the detriment of that backlog. So have we seen crime go up, like from a recidivist perspective of those people who were originally incarcerated for, a, for you know, having been arrested and then they're let out or, or we're not seeing some major spike? Because that's always been the argument is that, you know, if you let people out who, who potentially committed a crime too early before they were even convicted, that, that you could be uh, letting someone out who's dangerous to the entire community. Well, I think the, the focus has been on danger. The focus has been on physical violence. They, we have always strongly reacted to uh, physical violence, uh, but you, you, what you have seen is the economic crime where there is no violence involved, whether it's shoplifting on the low end or some um, um, scheme to defraud the elderly on the high end. Um, we don't need to incarcerate those people. Um, let's get them out of the jail system so that the case numbers are going up, but the jail population is going down. Your Honor, we have one minute left. Is, is there anything uh, that I didn't hit upon that, that you wanted to in part in terms of a takeaway from today in terms of how the legal system has adjusted in connection with, with the COVID crisis? Well, I got a kick out of your title on how, how the COVID-19 has made the court system better. Um, I think the COVID-19 has made um, society uh, re-examine itself, take its systems apart, reassemble them, and see, do we need this? From law offices who decided we don't need all this space to uh, um, people moving into high rises, they decide we don't need to live in a building that is 24, so that I got to ride the elevator every day. Um, families have re-examined re how they spend their free time. Do they go out together? Do they ride bikes together? So that these kind of events that affect everybody causes everybody to re-examine how do you run a restaurant? How do you run a business? How do you run a manufacturing plant? And they ask, how do you run a courthouse? So all of us are re-examining how we do things and how we can make it better. Your Honor, I want to thank you for joining us today at Zoom at Noon, from, sponsored by Oppenheim Law. Uh, as those of you who've been with us before, and we have a ton of questions. I can't get to all of them since we reduced this to a half hour because everyone has more important things than to spend an hour with us. Uh, but maybe we, we need more time. But the whole idea of this is to help all of us figure out how we're going to get along, how we're going to move forward, how, what's, what's around the next corner so that we can all cope together and, and get through this, this together. So. Uh, on behalf of everyone at, at Oppenheim Law, I, I want to thank uh, the judge and everyone else for participating today, and, and, and thank you for your time. We'll see you next week. Uh, Roy Oppenheim, Zoom at noon. Have a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you very much.